gentlemen, here are four of the nicest youngsters we've ever had on our stage. The Beatles, bring them on. I would say out of the whole Beatlemania, that's all you have to say is, yeah, 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 you know, and that sums it up, it really does, in one phrase. This is one of the great phenomenons of the modern music industry, is these four guys from a from a pretty working class background, from an industrial town, have created a whole wedge of music that is one timeless, two irreplaceable, and three will never be ever be copied. I think the Beatles, without a doubt, would be the biggest band in the world. In my opinion, there's no one bigger than the Beatles. great records and making great music which came from the heart and came from people that teenagers could identify with. So did the same people. As far as songwriters go, you know, Lennon McCartney, that their music will, will definitely you know live well well past the, the era of, of our generation. splitting the atom by listening to a Beatles song. We're actually sitting there and enjoying it. We're not having to think and be morbid, we're sitting there and enjoying it. We're, we're not have, having to dissect it and find another meaning, even though you could, because you just sit there and enjoy it. And that's what's great about their work. It's that it's about communication, and they've communicated all this time very quickly, and they will do for a while. Well, I mean, we have to go back to the very first, it, it, was called an artist test and uh, they of course their manager Brian Epstein he'd been around all the others as you probably know the other companies and been turned down but uh, he eventually did fix up a, a an artist test uh, for the Beatles anyway one long before the door opened of the studio and he walked these four guys of course I it was a double take when I looked at their hairstyling etc you know they haven't seen anything quite like that, all looking exactly the same hairstyle-wise. So I went down and, and introduced myself, and they in turn introduced themselves, and you know, John, Paul, George, Pete, as it was then, Pete Best. They started to sing and perform their numbers, and um, they had no, in, no indication at all that uh, their of their forthcoming songwriting ability. Didn't have any, any indication of that. And anyway, they eventually they left the control room, left George and I there. And George said to me, well, what do you think? So I said, well, yeah. I said, I've never seen anything. I've, I've tested quite a number of these guitar groups. I've never seen anything like these guys. I know what we've heard today <clears throat> uh, is, you know, pretty rubbishy. I said, but I think we ought to sign them because I think there's more to come. So George Marshall then said to me, hmm, uh, I'll think about it. It was the Beatles' um, first single. It was the first time you heard John and Paul sing. It was the first time you heard classic Beatles' middle eight. It was the first time you heard band sound, sound developed. Love Me, Love Me Do is pretty unusual in terms of Beatle tracks because what you always remember is the harmonica lick, which I think was nicked from uh, Bruce Chanel's Hey Baby, if I'm not mistaken. It lays heavily on the second and the fourth beat in the bar, and but that, that which gives the whole thing the groove. And it immediately diffuses all that kind of sugary sweetness that McCartney was addicted to. There was something so basic and simple and honest about this 
wonderful sound, Love Me Do, blasting from the jukebox, compared to, say, all the, the Tin Pan Alley songs that you were used to hearing, or even the old-style rock and roll tunes. I mean, if you go back to, to where this sort of style begins with rock and roll in the mid-50s, then it was, it was the energy and the crudeness of that that was absolutely crucial in the whole style catching on. But by 1962, we'd lost that. So in a sense, there was a rediscovery of that sort of crudeness. And what John did on that song and on many songs over the career of the Beatles is he would take the low harmony and that was really something that isn't done very often then or even now but th that intrigued me and it made the song have a very warm different tonal sound to it than you normally hear in a, in a, in a pop song. With a verse you'd normally expect a length of well, a regular length of something like 8, 12 or 16 bars. What we get here is 10. Um, there's a phrase which they begin with, which is repeated twice. Now, that's not unusual. But then it's repeated a third time. Now, that is unusual. And then we go into the end of the verse. At first sight, the uh, NEMS Enterprises, Brian Epstein's management company, did appear to be, um, I, I can't say amateur, because everyone was working very hard there, but um, a l lacking a little in organization. But as I say, everyone was very enthusiastic, which made up for it, really. And I don't believe that any uh, great errors were made in promotion, contractual re relationships and so on. No, it worked very well, it worked very well. Please Please Me, um, the second Beatles uh, single, the first number one. as more of a Roy Orbison type of a ballad type song. George Martin decided that no, we should speed it up a little bit, you know, and uh, give it a bit more of a faster pace. And, uh, and I think that was the, the success of that song, is the fact that, uh, you know, Martin could see something more in that song than when the Beatles first brought it to him. is quite climactic and it works extremely well. Very, very simple. It's basically it's a very overtly sexual invitation um, from Lennon. Um, you know, there's sort of the way that when it gets to the, uh, the chorus, it's come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, please, please me. Um, so he was being quite kind of, you know, tongue-in-cheek about it, but on later sort of examination, you can clearly see sort of it's, it's talking about sort of basically, you know, he's a fairly corny young dude. In those days, uh, bands played the instruments and they had backup groups to do harmony. And it, it was uh, almost unheard of for just the players themselves to be also doing all the harmonies and all the singing. It's like about when you hear a choir, a church choir, you get that feeling of uh, uh, warmth and contentment coming from it. And also, 
Um, I think this is part of the Beatles' secret, really, is that they seem to be singing directly to you, and uh, and that song really kind of sums up that that theme. Pop music, of course, was revolutionised by the Beatles, and this inevitably, I think, led to the need for very strong management, very personal management, and there have been a number of subsequent uh, managers who have, I don't know whether, whether it's fair to say, modelled themselves on Brian, but certainly had his methods, his very personal methods in mind in nurturing their own artists. Until the Beatles came along, the album chart was more or less the preserve of West End musical soundtracks, Hollywood soundtracks, balladeers, crooners. So while we look back at the albums now and uh, it's hard to judge what their impact was, I think certainly running through the 60s, the albums became more important be because the Beatles were important. We then did their first album. Uh, which we finished up doing in one day. That was three sessions, 10 to one, two to five, seven to 10, in one day, 13 tracks. And I always remember the, the last track was going to be Twist and Shout, which John Lennon was gonna sing. Well, by that time, his voice was pretty shattered the whole day. And uh, you know, he can barely talk properly, and so I thought, well, I've got, to, I must, I've got to get this in one take. So I've been not, you know, messing things up. So anyway, we did. We got it in one take. Cause I don't think he could have done take two. a really wise choice by George Martin and the EMI to not to put the sort of onus on the Beatles to come up with a whole album worth of material because I don't think they would have come up with as good an album. It, it was uh, intended to present the Beatles, being it was their first album, as a kind of a live feel as to what they were doing in their live shows. It doesn't matter whether the song is an original that they've written at the instruments or whether it's one that they, they simply like the vocal of or they like the harmonic pattern of. They do it in exactly the same way and it's that sort of commonality which blurs the, blurs the distance between the original stuff and the covers. Um, so you cover something like Twist and Shout and because you're used to the way that the Beatles approach it, if you didn't know the Isley Brothers original, it's a Beatles track. It's hard when you're a big fan of somebody to copy their work because you never imagine you can do as good a job as what they did. And I think the Beatles surpassed it easily. Isley Brothers do an awesome song, but really the Beatles version, there is something about the energy and the fact that it, it opened all their shows when they played in North America. Definitive version in many ways, especially with the uh, John Lennon's screaming vocals and Ringo's powerful explosions at the end when he finishes it with a couple of powerful snare drum beats. It's uh, still a great performance of that, of that uh, kind of soul anthem. <laughs> Remember that at, at this period, uh, albums were basically there to, to resell the single to people who'd already got it and to put in some padding just to, to make it album length. And something like Please Please Me begins to feel as if it belongs, all those tracks belong together. Ten of the tracks were done in one day, in one 15 hour day, I mean, to stereo. It's like amazing that, you know, that, that they, they arrive at such quality. When you would go to a concert, whether it be a big band, a small group, or, or whatever, you would be sitting in the audience of the venue and you would hear a mixture 
of direct sound from the stage but you would always get a mixture of the ambience of that room the throwback from the walls of whatever and I would stand back at the back of the studio and listen see if I could get this ambionic as I call it uh, sound a mixture of them and what was coming back from the studio and then I would place my mics accordingly sometimes a long way back to get a mixture as I thought of this sound Sometimes I had to use a little bit of, of the echo chamber on voice uh, uh, singing. Sometimes you used a bit of that. Other than that, it was just the sound that I got from direct and the ambient sound. And that, that's how I developed that sound of the Beatles. For me to you has the familiar Lennon and McCartney credit. Um, and in those days, Lennon and McCartney actually did write the songs together. They were on the road touring extensively, and so the half an hour here and 20 minutes in this hotel room and three hours before this show, John and Paul were sitting down and writing some of these songs that would cement the Beatles' musical sound. And most songs are two verses, then a chorus, and then a solo, and then it's repeated, but they go right into the chorus right off the bat, and then go into a verse, and uh, it, it, it brings some excitement to the beginning of a tune where you kind of go, whoa, what's that? And it's got the trademark in the middle of it from the Beatles, you know, which they were well known for. And if you look at the construction of it, it's a very cleverly constructed little pop song. Eight bar verse, followed by another eight bar verse, followed by an eight bar middle eight, let's call it, and then another eight bar verse. So you've got a standard uh, AABA 32 bar form, um, which is not uh, a key element of, of, uh, of rock and roll as they would have inherited it, but it comes from the sort of Tim Pan Alley tradition. They'd sort of gone and looked into jazz standards, classical music, and looked at how uh, material was constructed. And they'd come up with, you know, From Me to You, and it, was, it became a winning formula, and they employed it sort of countless times later as well. They're beginning to get a formula, but it's the middle eights and the verses and the changes from the verses to the chorus that give them the keys and the harmonies between John and Paul which make it very clever. Construction is all important really, it's just the sort of interplay between the voices and the message of the song is like from me to you. What a wonderful way to, to uh, establish a relationship really, not only between the, the, the guy and the girl that they're singing about but also between the band and its audience. Somehow the Beatles are giving you something. I've been asked so many times what was my favourite track, my favourite song. I can't answer that, because all of them were. There was only one song that I was a bit iffy about uh, when uh, I told you that uh, I used to record them singing live when I didn't have the four track. And so to do that, uh, I had had the vocal mic on a, configure of eight, uh, a figure of eight configuration uh, with the dead side looking at the group, uh, a microphone I'm talking about. And in front of that, I would use a music stand where they would put their lyrics, handwritten lyrics, to both Paul and John, could glance down and refresh their memory with the lyric. I set them up on this particular session, and uh, I went down later to, to check that all the mics were in position, and by this time they had put a lyric on the music stand. So I thought, oh, it'd be interesting, and I have a look. And uh, I went and had to look, handwritten, and it said, she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, 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 yeah. And I thought to myself, Christ, this is going to be a funny sort of song. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, 
yeah. You know, I mean, not brilliant lyrics uh, to say the least, but uh, certainly very historical and uh, it just shows you how simple that rock and roll could, could be. She almost lost her mind Now she said she knows You're not the hurting kind She said she loves you And you know that can't be bad Yes, she loves you And you know you should be glad yeah, It was just a perfect love song for the time Yes, she loves you and uh, if you listen to the lyrics, it really hit home with the young kids. And it was a massive hit. I mean, massive. It went, went in there and stuck for weeks. And, you know, they were selling 100,000 a day, for Christ's sake. You know, it was unbelievable. I mean, it just had all the ingredients of a great pop song. Great strong melody, great hook. That's the thing they knew about, you know. They knew how to, to get, get the hook of the song across, the chorus of the song across. What you've actually got there is what will become, ten years later, the verse, pre-chorus, chorus of mainstream pop and heavy metal. So if we threw away She Loves You, we'd lose the whole next 50 years of development. Really. What's great about the track overall, my favourite aspect of the track is the Ringo's drumming. I think it's really like superb and um, you know, Ringo doesn't really get the accolade he actually deserves, I think. Ringo has said about himself that um, he, uh, he can't play a drum solo to save his life. Uh, but what he is though, he's a great timekeeper. And uh, if you listen to some of the outtakes that have been released through the years uh, where there's breakdowns, it's never Ringo's fault. What he needed was a solid backbeat. He could certainly do that, a rock and roll feel. And also a kind of quirky, um, quirkiness to his playing. So you get all these unexpected little drum fills. I've heard it said that Ringo is a left-handed person playing right-handed drums. And if that's actually true, I'm not, a, I'm not a drummer myself, but if it's actually true, it could explain why he had his own little vocabulary on the drums, why he'd do certain patterns. I wanna be your man. Okay, well Lennon and McCartney came up with the lyrics and the melodies and the harmonies by and large. But they wouldn't be the songs we know were it not for the drum track that you've actually got there. Um, so his, his contribution as a performer is, is put on one side as a performer's contribution. A journalist asks John Lennon, you know, is Ringo the best drummer in the world? And John Lennon looks at him and says, mate, Ringo isn't even the best drummer in the Beatles. Because Paul McCartney used to play drums quite well, and um, McCartney was always on Ringo's, Ringo's sort of ass about, you know, about styles of playing, which uh, really hurt Ringo and, and sort of made him kind of feel vulnerable. His position was, yeah, he felt was vulnerable in the band throughout. Pardon, pardon, excuse, pardon. Yeah. More, I'd like more drums there. No, I think it's on that. It the sounds other like a on the other cover, bit. Right, on, cover. on the third bit, you know, no, on the third, third bit. bit okay. More okay. bang! If you put another drummer in the Beatles, would they be as good? No. Would they be the Beatles? No. Ringo is a Beatle. He's an important element of them becoming as successful as they became. And the Americans loved Ringo. I mean, he was the most popular Beatle. Um, and they had like campaigns, Ringo for president. Most of the novelty songs that came out in 64 and 65 were about Ringo. You know, uh, one of them was that, uh, you know, you won't go far without a guitar unless you're Ringo Starr. That was a great title for a song. came to America, came to New York to um, suss out the American scene for, with the thought of bringing the Beatles over to America, where they were becoming, um, people, people knew about them, there was such a buzz in, in England that um, it had penetrated the American press. Um, 
I was the only person that Brian knew in New York and so of course we got together and I showed him around New York and so on and I didn't really know what he was um, doing business-wise he didn't talk about it to me then but in fact he was seeing people like Ed Sullivan for the biggest uh, TV show that there was in America those days arranging for uh, the possibility for the Beatles coming over and appearing on the Ed Sullivan show which of course they did eventually oh, yeah. The Ed Sullivan shows was extremely important. It was a big deal. They saw how an American TV show worked. The whole of America saw the Beatles. So as a springboard for America, it was huge. By just having one or two performances for him, they could basically cover the whole of America coast to coast. You know, you hear stats like, you know, the juvenile delinquent crime rate dropped that night because everyone was at home watching it on television. You know, just like everyone who was alive in, in that era could tell you where they were when they heard Kennedy died, most people will tell you that they saw the Beatles that night in February. To appear on the Ed Sullivan Show was like the music business seal of approval. When you were on Ed Sullivan, you were a star, and uh, I think it, it, to us young kids at the time, it, it uh, solidified the fact that these guys are mega stars, and they're here to stay. I think it was very sort of careful, clever management that got the Beatles to where they are, but the Ed Sullivan shows were crucial in their career development. It was crucial, really. Uh, I don't know if you could say they were being marketed. Um, I think they were just being unveiled, really. I prefer that uh, this phenomenon of the Beatles. Uh, the Americans just love the group. people that grew up in that era, especially people that later went on to form bands, the very first time they saw the Beatles was on the Ed Sullivan show in, in February 1964, and that was the song that was number one at the time. And for a lot of people, they equate the early Beatles with I Want to Hold Your Hand, especially in North America. That song really defines an era. It was actually quite a lot slower. It was almost like a ballad when they, were, they wrote it, and George Martin lifted the tempo, uh, and that's what made it click straight away. It's just a very cool simple subject matter which was very well done in, a, in the great Beatles way with great melodies, great middle eights, just very well put together. And when I touch you I feel happy inside It's such a feeling that I love I can't hide, I can't hide, I can't hide in yeah, you got that tongue John Lennon plays what would be considered almost as prehistoric heavy metal kind of a rhythm guitar track. Very aggressive. It's got a really strong melody against the chords. And that's why I think a song like that stands the test of time because of the power of the melody. It may have been a simple song, but the way it was performed and the combination of the two, plus of course the visuals, remember that television was beginning to come into its own then, that really the Beatles made each and every song of theirs their own. The vocals explode into uh, almost an orgasmic uh, kind of a finale. It just keeps going and going. And, uh, you know, it's just the most important thing in his life is he's got to hold that girl's hand. And he really, really means it, you know. I think you understand when I feel that something I want to It was um, pretty hair-raising at times. Uh, I recall, in fact, that the first time I saw them, before I was working for Brian, in fact, was in New York, 
when he had um, negotiated for them to appear in Carnegie Hall, a very prestigious venue in New York, where the um, New York Philharmonic Orchestra appears and similar classical occasions. Um, I had a seat, I and uh, I guess a friend had a seat behind the band, uh, looking out at, uh, at the, uh, the main audience, with a, and there were quite a number of us behind the band as well. And um, really, one could hardly hear a sound of the beaches, the cheering, the shouting, the carrying on, the screaming it was so extraordinary. All My Loving, for me, is one of the great unsung heroes of the Beatles era, the early era. It's such a, an unbelievably great song. Close your eyes and I'll kiss you. When All My Loving came out, uh, it was on their uh, second album in England with the Beatles. And uh, by the time they came over to North America, that uh, song was, was one of the first songs I think they opened up with The Sullivan Show. All my loving. a key song in the Beatles' career. Um, it was just the right balance between kind of schmoozy romanticism and kind of professional, quite hard-driving rock band. And there's a sense in which they're taking further what they have done previously, because instead of basically four chord loops, which is, is what we've had up to this point, you have a much longer pattern. Gosh, it sounds like organ music like that, doesn't it? But that's what they're doing. That's, that's the underlying pattern. If you have an eight chord sequence. And they finish with that. Now, uh, we happen to be in, in E major at this point. That chord belongs that chord is borrowed from a sort of um, a blues background. This is about where they started losing some of the high end in their sound, in, in my opinion. You won't hear that cymbal uh, crash and the snare quite as much. You're starting to hear a little bit more of the bottom end of the song, a little bit more bass. Bass is a little more predominant in that song, in the drums as well as the actual bass playing. Paul had this walking bass line that was unheard of before. It just there were so many chords in it, and he just had this, this beautiful walking bass line all the way through. And it was kind of overshadowed even by John's um, um, jangly uh, rhythm guitar, which is very, very hard to execute on stage or studio or anything. And Lennon always uh, said that, uh, you know, he had a hard time playing that song because of the complicated sort of uh, fretting pattern on that song. Uh, so definitely it was a step up. The Beatles were experimenting more. They were doing something that was different. They weren't copying so much as, as developing and innovating. What we have here is a, a song, I think, that's fairly well advanced, certainly compared with their first compositions on the first album. To this day, I, you know, I can't believe that a song so good that they would never have used it as a single. But uh, that's certainly my all-time favorite Beatles song. I can listen to that thing forever. All my love. By then they could have easily written the whole album, but I think obviously because again they're a new band still, even though they were knocking out number ones like like you know like anybody's business, they still obviously had, people around them still didn't trust them to write a whole whole album full of their own material, which I think is a bit sad because I think they could have. You couldn't yet get away with an album of entirely self-penned material. 
So you actually had to put in some standards in there. Things like um, money and um, roll over Beethoven work well because they're the sort of rock and roll stuff that the Beatles have been playing for years. They're very familiar with that sort of style um, and they're beginning to turn out things in their own style. <laughs> A lot of these American influences were very much uh, a big draw on the Beatles. They, 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 they really wanted to put a lot of these songs into their repertoire. And I think at the time when that album came out, they were still unsure that their songs on their own could sell an album. So you throw a bunch of different covers on there too because the average record buyer will go, oh, I know that song, Money, and they'll buy the album maybe on that purpose. It, it's a way of sort of cementing themselves within the tradition to take on a song like that, which may not belong really within their, within their repertoire, but because it uses material that they themselves use elsewhere, it's a way of saying, you know, we are, we are actually firmly within this... Gosh, you don't want to think about tradition really, do you, for, for, for early Beatles? But that, that really is what they're saying, you know, we're not doing anything outrageous. <laughs> that was a hard day's night, you know, kind of thing. And uh, John and Paul go, hey, there's a song, you know. I mean, what a way to start an album. You know, this was still, um, this was still a world where you expected uh, introductions, proper introductions to songs. And all you get is this dissonant chord, which rings and actually suggests nothing about what's going to follow. I mean, incredible. It's been a hard There's no way that you can't actually just hear the beginning of that song and know who it is and what it is. It's a brilliant song. This was the, the start of bringing in the slightly tougher approach and then juxtaposing it with the slightly sugary, more sort of softer middle section. There's a sort of bit of a, a sort of a slight humour in there as well. It's not completely, you know, sort of just hard days and nights sort of playing words. So it's still got a little bit of the kind of sort of romantic Beatles sort of theme running through it, but it's kind of much more confident and it was a step forward in in melody and the way the 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 backing vocals were arranged very very good song and, and yet it came from such simple beginnings right a, a funny phrase that was said in passing to a, a song that was written in an evening to you know to being recorded a couple of days later and you know it, the title of a film and, and stuff like that it just shows you uh, uh, how the Beatles had progressed in such a short period of time and could also deliver the goods so quickly. So I suppose the, uh, the next big step for the Beatles was to go on to the, the screen. I mean, people had seen them on television, but everybody had uh, wanted to really get closer to the Beatles and see them, hear them talking, find out what they were like. It was the first harder rock movie that, that was made that was a success in the cinemas. One slip of the razor and... <laughs> Help me! Headphones! Help me! They just blew everyone away. They just made the right film with the right director, with the right script, 
at the right time, using all the right material. They couldn't have done it better. Because United Artists thought the Beatles would probably just be a flash in the pan, sort of, you know, overnight success and then disappear, uh, they decided to make the movie for a £150,000 budget and in black and white to save money. Um, so I think, in fact, that actually, Paul McCartney said that thank God they made it in black and white because if it had been in colour, it would have been crap. It could have been a disaster. It could have gone the wrong way. They could have proven to be uh, inept and uh, embarrassing or perhaps just not at home in a film medium. Um, but in fact, they turned out to be uh, just as... Uh, um, confident and uh, self-possessed as they appeared on the stage or in interviews. Tell me, uh, how did you find America? Turn left to Greenland. Has success changed your life? Yes. I'd like to keep Britain tidy. Are you a mod or a rocker? Um, no, I'm a mocker. <laughs> a Hard Day's Night was more or less art imitating life. Um, showing a beat group going around the country in a bus, being chased by fans and uh, never having a moment's rest. So you could say that it wasn't exactly challenging to write the script for that one. In fact, a lot of people think that it was all ad-libbed, but there was virtually no ad-libbing at all. It was all scripted, written by a scriptwriter, Alan Owen. But because they were sort of young and they'd never acted and they were a little bit nervous, uh, each line has a maximum of six words in it. Brown was a very hands-on manager. He was their greatest fan. And um, he had their interests at heart in every conceivable respect. He went with them on tour everywhere. He discussed with them deals that he was making on their behalf. He planned tours with their full knowledge. They were his whole life, really, at that time. Well, all the, all the time there. Obviously, what the Beatles would do for the movie musical, which in a sense was what this now was, an updating of the musical tradition, um, that would obviously set a tone for other groups to follow and for what was to come later in the decade. That's another first for the Beatles. World can buy me love. Can't Buy Me Love was an interesting song because it was the first major Beatles song to feature one vocal rather than Lennon and McCartney together. And of course seeing the Beatles in the movie A Hard Day's Night uh, aping around in the giant field when that song was playing, um, you know, it just it had a real fun flavor to it. And I think still at this stage, George Martin was just helping them to, you know, d drop that chord there, guys, or, you know, that's good, repeat that. So he was giving them his arrangement ideas. But what's significant is that the guitar, um, the electric guitar, has really comes to the fore and is mixed louder and drives the track along. It was much more sort of aggressive, not in a mad way, but they were mo there was a tougher sort of sound and a tougher record and slightly more guitar-y. And I think in that way, it made slightly more impact. The public responded really well. They really liked um, the kind of more driving, harder edge, because um, by now, bands like The Stones were starting to not really give the Beatles so much competition, but they were, they were dirtier and harder and more kind of rock and roll. And the Beatles already were sort of starting to take on this kind of goody-goody image, which I don't think they really liked. <laughs> So you've got the blue third and you've got a, a melody which is falling all the time and it's scalic. Those characteristics are all important. You get into the, into the middle eight or the bridge. You've lost your blue third. You've lost the falling nature of the melody. It's now basically rising. And you've lost the scalic aspect. It's now... Um, uh, basically an arpeggio. I suppose you realise this is private property? Sorry we aren't your field, mister.
In retrospect, uh, I would consider that George Martin was the fifth Beatle. We were like a, a happy family, the, 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 the six of us. It was that tight. It was uh, so enjoyable up to that time, everything. I mean, George Martin used to call himself the fifth Beatle. Well, I, I argued with him on that when I did interviews. He wasn't. He, he said I was the sixth, but I used to reverse it. I was the fifth, he was the sixth. They could do something he couldn't do, and he could do something they couldn't do. Perfect marriage. Without him, they would, we wouldn't have had such great records at all. And it's very hard to work out where production ends and arrangement begins, because with Can't Buy Me Love, for instance, when you hear that song, you hear the chorus comes first. In fact, when they played it to him, the chorus didn't come first. He said, well, put it up front, lads, that's where it belongs, that's where it'll hit home quickest. And if you like, if that was a production hint, an arrangement or whatever, it was something George Martin helped them out with that helped make the song. He allowed an unknown band to record their own material. Major step, changed everything for everyone over the whole planet. They changed everything. From then on in, new bands with no track record, with nothing behind them, could, could, could record their own material. This has never been done before. He changed pop music forever. He was able to write for strings, he was able to walk into an orchestra session and say, I want you to play this, I want you to play that, write it down, give it to the, the musicians and they could play it or play on the piano. And the Beatles respected him and he respected them. As time went on, perhaps they outgrew him, but certainly for the, uh, for the early to mid period, it was uh, a large part of George Martin that went in with the Lennon and McCartney. They learned a lot from George Martin, and uh, he, he was at, at the right place at the right time, and uh, thank God for that. <laughs> I'm not sure whether to say it's an improvement to the Hard Day's Night album because it's entirely Lennon and McCartney compositions. I actually think there's, there's more consistency there because this is all their own material. It was great. They listened to an album that was all new. It wasn't covers where, oh yes, I've heard that song. Great cover, but I've heard the song. And I think it was a landmark in that sense where you knew they were here to stay. McCartney is an amazing songwriter and an amazing bass player because he plays a melody on a bass, which people don't see. His bass playing is really, really clever. He did things that no other bass player did uh, at that time, and probably very few do today. People didn't really notice the bass much before Paul started playing it, because he, it, he usually played quite high up. Um, you know, it's a kind of light, sort of sing, swinging bass playing, really. It kind of has a singing quality. His, his bass playing reflects his vocal style in many ways. started creating melodies, counterpoints to the guitar, which really added to the vocabulary of someone who would learn the bass after him. Yeah, Paul McCartney is really quite an interesting bass player. Uh, for instance, one of the things he might do when he was playing is if, you're playing, if he's playing over a C chord, the first bar he'd play the C root, the second bar he'd move to the third of the chord and play the E root. If he was playing over a G chord, First bar he might play G, and then he'd move to the B. So there's always this climbing feeling, and he had a great ear for doing it, all, all that sort of, taking something and making it a little bit more melodic without it being complex. Hit songs before the Beatles were more or less Boy Girl, Moon June, something based on what a, a guy would buy his girlfriend or possibly vice versa. So when the Beatles took up their songwriting pens, uh, it was obvious to carry on the tradition that they knew all about. It is the Beatles locking into what everybody else was singing about. 
and presumably what their audiences wanted to listen to songs about. It was, it was to do with, with them speaking to their fans. And uh, when you li look back, I guess it was a bit repetitious, but at the time, nobody noticed. Him and John would actually sit down and they'd think like, if I was a teenage girl, what would I want the Beatles to sort of, you know, say to me kind of thing, or what would I want? And so they were really, really uh, aware of that sort of thing. And they wanted to make songs where people, you know, especially that teen market, would, would pick up on that, and especially the young girl market would want them to think that, oh, this, you know, probably the song for me kind of thing, you know, and, you know, th this kind of idea. So I think originally that, that really uh, drove them with their songwriting. It's part of the Beatles, you know, it's, it's without that, I think there would have been another great band, but I think that's, that's the sort of the whole issue of love is what established them at the top in the first place. So they wisely uh, kept that sort of theme running through their, 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 their output. Had they been singing about women and uh, different things or singing about, as opposed to girls, um, I think we probably would have miss, missed the message and I don't think they would have been nearly as big as they were. Years later, they began to write songs about, like, for instance, she's a woman. Now, I, that would be where I would think they suddenly, when we were all a little bit older then too, so it was probably their evolution along with us that made them continue on to be strong with that group of Beatle maniacs, I guess. But she's a woman who understands. She's a woman who loves a man. My love, don't give me a present. I know that she's no present. Only ever has to give me love forever and forever. My love, don't give me a present. She's a woman tends to go back to that bareness. It's a, it's a very uncluttered sort of texture. The emphasis is very much on the voice and the melody because there's not really much else going on. And I see that as a positive, as a sort of um, retrenchment almost, because that will look ahead to things like uh, Norwegian Wood, where they can approach a, a thinner texture in a, in a positive way and realise perhaps that Everybody doesn't have to play all the time. The other particularly striking thing about She's a Woman is the title. Because up to this point, they've been singing about little girls. And all of a sudden, they're singing about a woman. Um, well, that, that says something, doesn't it? I Feel Fine will always be remembered for the feedback front. Big mistake, very genius to leave it. Some debate over was it in fact the first song with feedback and whether it was or, or not is uh, up for debate, but it's the first one that I ever heard. And it's a, it's a fun song. Again, the Beatles could deliver the goods. I Feel Fine, a Lennon song, She's a Woman, a McCartney song. A great combination of something for everybody there. I think that the process of moving from songs which depend on their chord structures to songs which depend on riffs is is missed. I mean, we, we, we never really focus on that moment of change, but it's a fundamental change, and it begins to happen in around 1965, 1966. Uh, in 2005, we're playing out the consequences of that move. So this is crucial.
opposed to their earlier albums, the songs were uh, a little bit uneven. It's actually the last one I ever bought because um, I didn't know anything on it except eight days a week and um, having got hold of it, I've never listened to it again. I saw the Beatles twice at Hammersmith Odeon on their Christmas shows. You couldn't hear anything. The noise was mental, the, the, the girls were wetting themselves, it was all getting silly. You've got to remember back in those days, guitar amplifiers were 30 watt. You didn't really have the amplification systems that you have now. You didn't even have the amplifications you would have at the end of the 60s. So really, when it came to playing live, the Beatles were always on to a loser. In a lot of cases, they had to just kind of wing it as to, and hope that they were all playing together. When you listen to the old tape recordings of these uh, performances, uh, they did pretty darn good, you know, considering they couldn't hear themselves. I think I'm gonna be sad. Musically, maybe, they, they probably even couldn't even hear the Beatles. I mean, the Beatles couldn't even hear themselves play. So, I mean, it, you went there to be there kind of thing. I think that was the whole idea with the Beatles concerts at that time. So, you know, what are your criteria for a great live band? If the criterion is, well, somebody who can whip up a hell of a lot of enthusiasm, they didn't even have to play a note in order to do that. So, yes, they were a great live band, but were they great musicians on stage? Um, possibly not. She would never be free when I was around. She's got a ticket to ride. The next time I saw them um, was at um, Forest Hill Stadium. And there, the audience, the, the kids in the audience, the, were very excited before the Beatles arrived. And very sensibly, they came by helicopter because the roads were all snarled up with crowds getting there. And it was an extraordinary experience because um, when they landed, all the, um, the, the audience stood up and sort of looked up at the helicopter and raised their arms. It was almost like worshipping gods descending among them. Well, it was almost like that. And um, then the, the, the performance was great, as always. The screaming was loud, as always. And after the show, I was leaving, walking away with my friend. We had not come by helicopter. We were walking to our car, and um, some of the kids leaving the show heard me speaking, and they said, oh, he's British, he's British. And such was the excitement about the Beatles at that stage that um, they really were quite excited to see an Englishman there. And uh, I thought that if I told them that I actually had met the Beatles, they might have torn my clothes off. But, uh, however, all, all went very well. They were a very good band, but they were never given the chance to be a good band once they became really popular, because you could just hear nothing but screaming. I only saw them when, they were, when everyone was going mental and potty. And it was a great privilege to say I've seen the Beatles, but I didn't actually hear them. The Beatles played rock and roll very well, and they also came out with these extraordinary original songs, which uh, didn't talk down to people. I think that's the important thing. That's why the Beatles... Um, struck a chord with so many people, not just teenage girls screaming at John and Paul, but um, the whole uh, adult world as well loved the Beatles very quickly. When you think of the Beatles song, you think, Christ, I wish I could write a song like that, but not anyone could think of them. It was, it was the, the simple simplicity of them which made them very clever. And everyone goes, oh no, it's not very clever. It's not very clever now because it's been done. But remember, they opened those doors, no one else did.
once they did that first album live in the studio, the next albums after that they wanted to play with some of the controls themselves and get behind the console and uh, I think that had a huge impact on their sound and their growth and I don't think we'd be listening to them today if they just remained in the studio and somebody else was behind the glass in the engineer booth. The fact that the Beatles wanted to get in and control what their sound was going to sound like had a huge impact on their final outcome of any of their albums.